Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'd like to talk to you about the sense of sight. Yeah, the sense of sight is probably humans' most important sense of all. We really gather a lot of knowledge about our world from uh, visual perception. And so uh, this conversation is about the structure and function of the eye, and hopefully it'll intrigue you, and you'll be able to see how interesting the eye truly is. And so here's a typical eye. Uh, I'm going to walk you through the eye, but I'm also going to discuss a couple of accessory organs that you might be familiar with. And so, um, you know, right out of the gate, you can see most of us are familiar with like this pigmented region of the eye right here. And this is called the iris. And so when you uh, des describe a person's eye color, usually you're referring to this right here, iris, as... Uh, the, the goddess of the rainbow. And so therefore, it's, it's kind of a cool name, Iris. This white area right here that you see is called the sclera, or the outer covering of the eye right there. You can see that. And then obviously there's blood vessels right here, which are providing oxygen and nutrients to the eye as well. The eyelashes and then eyelid right there. And then how about this? This dark structure in the center is actually a physical hole. That's right, it's an actual hole where light is traveling through. It's called the pupil. And the pupil receives light, very much like a student is a pupil that is receiving knowledge. <laughs> and so our ability to see, uh, it comes from the fact that, you know, th things are not really generating a lot of light. And so light, let's just say, is, is coming from the sun and it's reflecting off of an object. And so what we're seeing is reflected light. And so that's, that's important. And so when light enters the eye, it's, it's pretty much unfocused. And so you have the very outer covering or window of the eye is called the cornea. So like in any of the videos having to do with the senses, at first there's the anatomy comes strong, but eventually uh, you'll get comfortable with it. And I'll try to discuss physiology as well. So the cornea is the outer window of the eye right here. It's clear for the most part and lights coming in. Let me see if I can animate that. So lights coming in. It's pretty much unfocused. Here's some rays of light coming in and the cornea is number one. The first step in seeing is to focus the light rays. And so the cornea is attempting to do that. And to a lesser degree, there's a fluid right behind the cornea called the aqueous humor. And that helps to sort of refract the light a little bit. And so the cornea is refracting the light, helping to focus it. And then number two, as the light travels into the pupil, it's going to meet, it's going to meet the lens and that's going to help to, to focus as well. And then ultimately the light is going to travel back into the, into the posterior part of the eye and it's going to be uh, focused on the retina. And again, you might be familiar with this, uh, this terminology, but the retina is the back of the eye. So we're going to need to look at the sort of the layers of the eye. It's called the tunics, the different layers. And the, and the retina is obviously in the, the back. And so the retina is where light is being focused. And this macula is a region right here uh, uh, that is where light is focused best. It's sort of a, a circular region. Um, it's sort of yellow in color. And this is where light is uh, um, hopefully uh, being projected, if you will, on the back of the eye. And this vitreous is this gelatin-like, it's called vitreous humor, this gelatin-like material. It's kind of, kind of like clear jello, and it's helping to keep the shape of the eye round. And that's also, to a degree, uh, helping to focus the light as, as the rays pass through this gelatin material. And then ultimately, what's happening is um, there's going to be some action potential generated by nerve cells in the retina. And then all of that is going to be transmitted through uh, fascicles through a very large nerve called the optic nerve. And the optic nerve is then going to travel from behind the eye up into the brain where we're actually going to uh, sense light and also uh, perceive what it's meaning. And so I find this to be kind of intriguing that uh, it's somewhat poetic that the, it's the back of the brain that sees. <laughs> so it's kind of like hindsight. <laughs> so 
So it's the back of the brain called the occipital lobe that's actually uh, perceiving light and helps us to see. So the optic nerve is going from the front all the way to the back, the optic, the occipital lobe. So let's talk a little bit about accessory organs to the eye before we get into the detailed uh, anatomy of the eye. Uh, you might be familiar with the fact, uh, because probably all of us in our lives have teared up once in a while, we have these uh, lacrimal glands, these lacrimal glands, and I say glands because there's one on one side and the other, and so they're more lateral over here. This is more medial to the center, so they're lateral uh, to the nasal cavity. And what's interesting is they provide uh, fluid in, in the form of tears. And so there's little ducts that travel down from this. It's an exocrine gland because it's secreting to the outside. And these ducts travel down and they help to cleanse the eye, to remove uh, dust and debris and particle from the eye, as well as sort of the eyelid opening and closing. Now, excessive tears travel down these two ducts right here, which are medial, which then enter into the nasal cavity. And so we're going to also talk about extrinsic muscles that help move the eye around in a moment. But this uh, lacrimal apparatus or lacrimal gland, which includes these ducts that I was describing before, um, bring tears into the eyes that help cleanse it, uh, helping us to see. And then there's these two little ducts, lacrimal ducts, that come off to the, the side here, the medial, that enter into the, into the nasal cavity right there. And so what's interesting is the Tears themselves contain, I find, I'm kind of a, a molecular person, they, they contain uh, antibacterial enzymes called lysozymes, lysozymes, and those help to uh, ford off any invaders that are trying to infect our eye. Now, I was mentioning uh, another accessory organs are these extrinsic eye muscles. Now, this is looking at the eye from the side, and so i uh, give you a chance to sort of handle the the shock value <laughs> of this picture. But this white of the eye is the sclera. And again, there's a lot of uh, skeletal muscle involved here, the, these extrinsic muscles. And then this is the optic nerve. I don't know what you're thinking, but the optic nerve's pretty large. You could see it. Uh, it comes right off and enters into the brain like a, an extension cord. And so these extrinsic muscles are really important. They allow us to move our eyes in different directions. And so you can see up and down. And so of course, muscles uh, are all named. And so you have these uh, you know, prefixes here uh, in terms of anatomy, superior meaning towards the top, inferior meaning low. Uh, and then you have lateral to the side, uh, media, uh, medial meaning towards the middle of the eye. So this would be the right eye if, you, if, if, if you're following that conversation. Um, this. Uh, Levator muscle right here is a, is a cool one that helps to lift the eye, the levator muscle, and as, as opposed to a depressor that would uh, push something down. This is a levator lifts the eye up. And so there's all kinds of muscles that help the eye move around. Over here you can see the cornea, which is the clear window of the eye, and there's the iris, the pupil right there, the sclera. And then here's your, uh, your eyelid right there. And then of course, the whole eye is inside the skull. And this skull region is, is called an orbital right there. So the orbit of the eye is, is, is uh, protected by that. And what's not shown, but it's highly present, is a lot of adipose tissue. So there's a, a tremendous amount of fat that's surrounding the eye in, in order to cushion it and to stabilize it. And then there's the optic nerve. If you put all the adipose tissue there, it'd be difficult to see. And so here's your eyelids. Eye, eyelids are kind of interesting because I find them uh, fascinating because they're the, the thinnest skin of the whole body and they help to, to protect the eye. Um, and they're able uh, to open and close. And again, these uh, eyelashes are hairs that protrude from the eyelid that are preventing uh, sweat or um, uh, debris to enter into the eye. So those are protection. Again, here's a nice uh, cross-section of the eye. Here's your uh, lavator muscle right over here that helps to lift the eye. Um, let's just look at this. Here's, here's, it looks like this eye uh, lid is closed, as you can see right here. Do you look how thin the eyelid truly is? And so um, inside the eye, I mentioned this outer part, the window of the eye is the cornea, but the truth is there's a thin layer of tissue 
and very, very faint blood vessels, uh, a tissue that covers the eye completely. It's called conjunctiva. And this tissue, uh, the cells um, are rather spaced out and it allows for light to be able to pass through. There's not a lot of blood vessels in the front of the eye because that would obscure our vision. And this, this creates a cavity up in the front right here, which is filled with fluid. This is called the aqueous humor. And again, here is the uh, iris, which is the colored portion of the eye, and then that opening is the pupil. So the rays of light, if I were to illustrate it, are obviously they can't come in because the eyelid is closed, but if they were to come in, they'd come in right there, straight through the pupil, and then hit the lens. Now the lens is kind of an interesting structure. We'll be talking about that in a moment. Do you notice that it's actually suspended by some ligaments right here and some muscles that are behind the front of the eye? And so those muscles are rather important too. Um, and the iris itself is, is muscular. Um, that's kind of cool too. Um, and so this conjunctiva is this thin tissue that I was talking about previously. And I think most people have, um, when they think of conjunctiva, they usually don't consider it too much unless there's a problem. And sometimes our conjunctiva can become uh, infected. You know, uh, it, it's like, uh, it's typical that these outer regions of the body are, are vulnerable, like ear infections and eye infections. And so inevitably, bacteria is going to get in, involved in the, in the discussion. And so this is referred to as uh, conjunctivitis. Sometimes we just simply call it pink eye. And you can tell that there's inflammation. So the blood vessels are becoming dilated to allow uh, white blood cells to, to sort of fight off the, uh, the bacterial infection. So this could be treated with antibiotic. And so um, let's take a look at the structure of the eye. And I know that this is kind of an overwhelming slide. I'll sort of take my time with it. But there's different layers of, of the eye, different tunics. And so let's go from the outer tunic all the way back. Uh, I mentioned here, and I'll just sort of check them off as we go. I mentioned the, the cornea, which is this outer layer of the eye, which is the window. It also has this thin layer of conjunctiva on the outside. The pupil, again, is the hole where the light's traveling through. The lens is where the, the light is being focused, but the cornea is also focusing it. The iris is the colored part of the eye, which is actually muscles. And I, and I say that they're muscles. The iris is muscles because you know that the iris is capable of con contracting and enlarging. So it's, it's able to uh, like open and close to allow, for example, at night, the iris is able to open up, providing a big diameter to allow the maximum amount of light in. But if somebody were to shine a light in your eye, it would constrict. And so it's capable of doing that, the iris. And so this aqueous humor, uh, let it not be confused with vis, where is it, vis, vitreous humor. Now vitreous humor looks like it's just pointing to this red in, this, in the center, but if you ever have an opportunity to dissect an, uh, an eye, uh, you'll never be confused with vitreous humor. Vitreous humor is this gelatin material which is helping to keep the shape of the eye, and to a degree it helps to focus the light as well. The aqueous humor is rather clear, and it, it's not as viscous. It's sort of just like water in consistency, and it helps to keep this um, uh, area um, elongated right here. And so this cavity that's in the front of the eye is known as the anterior cavity, and it's made up of the anterior chamber and posterior chamber, whether or not you're talking about in front of the iris or behind the iris. If it's behind the iris, it's still in front of the lens the posterior chamber, as a, uh, an anterior chamber, as opposed to posterior chamber, which is this chamber back here. So there's two chambers in the eye. There's this back here and this up over here. And again, here's the uh, extrinsic muscles, the medial, and here's the lateral rectus over here. And then in the back of the eye, let's just jump around over here. This is the optic nerve. This is where the nerve impulses are traveling up to the brain. What's fascinating about this is you can see this when you look into the eye. Um, uh, this, there is a circular disc where you can actually see the, uh, the optic nerve connecting. And the optic disc, uh, where the optic nerve connects to the posterior chamber, is actually a blind spot. You can't see anything because there's no photoreceptor cells right there. That's kind of interesting. We never really uh, detect it because we have two eyes and we're always making adjustments. 
And this uh, fovea centralis is an area where is maximum absorption, or in other words, maximum focus of light. So when the rays are coming in, this is where you really want them to focus on the uh, fovea centralis. It's where the, the macula is, this sort of red, uh, yellowish region. And there's a lot, high density of photoreceptors there, especially color ones, cones, which I'll, I'll come back to in a moment. The white of the eye is called the sclera. So that's the outer part of the eye. And then there's a couple of layers right here to the eye, not including the muscle, the muscles on the very outside, but the outer is the sclera. But then there's this middle darken layer called, and it's very dark because it's pigmented with melanin. It's called the coracoid coat. And the important thing there is sort of like a movie theater. When you want your image being focused on the screen, you don't want a lot of um, scattering of light. And so the corticoid coat helps to absorb, absorb random rays of light that are refracting through the eye. So it's very dark in the eye. And so that's why the pupil is black because it's, it's, you're looking into the eye and you're seeing the darkness inside. And then of course, the retina, which is this thin tissue on the inside of the eye where, where light is being focused, okay? So I hope that was helpful. So th again, uh, the outer tunic uh, is transparent, the cornea right here, and the white of the eye is called the sclera, okay? And uh, sometimes, just to point this out, sometimes the cornea needs some adjustment because I, I was mentioning how that's the, the first part of focusing uh, when light is coming in. So this is known as a LASIK procedure where uh, a thin uh, knife cuts the outer part of the cornea right here and then uh, a laser comes down, the eczema laser comes down and it actually reshapens and flattens the cornea so that when the rays come in, they're able to focus more sharply on the back of the eye perfectly. And so a person uh, who's having uh, problems with focus uh, can have LASIK procedure. And so again, this uh, middle tunic uh, is made up of the coracoid coat. And it's this blue layer. It's not really blue. It's kind of dark black in coloration. But it has, it has two functions. It has a lot of blood vessels right in here, which is helping to nourish all the cells of the retina. But it's also uh, helping to keep the eye really, really, really dark. Um, again, to help um, focus on where you want it to. And so it's sandwiched in between the sclera and the retina, this dark pigment. So it's in the middle layer. And so it's opaque, meaning that it's, uh, it's dark, it's deeply pigmented with melanin, and that helps the light uh, to absorb sort of excessive internal reflection. Now, what's curious about that is, uh, and again, a lot of blood vessels to help nourish. What's curious about this reflection thing is this is a, a picture of a cow eye, but there are animals that are nocturnal. You might be familiar with like bears or, or cats, or if you ever shine light on, a, on, on your cat, you'll notice that there's their, their eyes appear to glow. And that's because they have uh, this uh, shiny, it sort of looks almost like the inside of a, uh, a shell, like for example, an abalone shell. It has this sort of, um, I don't know uh, how to describe this uh, sort of translucent uh, membrane called the tempedum. And, and this tissue is actually uh, behind the retina. It's behind, it's posterior to the retina. And its function is to actually to amplify light. And so animals that are spending a lot of time outside have this tempedum that help to uh, help them to see in the dark. It's kind of interesting. We don't have Humans, we do not have a tempedum, but it, but it's a kind of an interesting thing. And back back here, you could see, excuse me, this is the that dark area called the corticoid coat right there. And the the retina is kind of a kind of a light brown in, uh, coloration. It's a thin membrane, which is made up of the photoreceptors. So here's the iris, the colored part of the eye. It's all different shades, and this is controlled by genetically, as you may know. And it's it's really smooth muscle that adjusts the amount of light opening uh, that can enter into the light, in, into the eye. And so it's a set of circular uh, muscles which radiate outward as, as fibers, which is kind of cool. 
So the iris is a colorful, uh, thin, smooth muscle. Now, behind the iris are is this uh, area called the ciliary body. And the ciliary body is also made up of muscles, which are connected through with len uh, ligaments that hold on to the lens. The lens isn't just, just sitting there. It's suspended by the fact that it's being held in place by by ligaments connected to these cili ciliary muscles. And the whole point of that is, when these muscles contract, they can actually squeeze the shape of the lens and make it a little bit thicker. The lens is thick on the inside towards the center and thinner on the outside. And so um, this is a nice look, like if you're in the eye looking back towards the front of the eye. And so th this is again, this dark area right here, this is what we're looking at. So we're inside the eye looking at this. So the ciliary body, and these are all the ligaments that are holding on to the lens. And so these little muscles can contract right here. So these muscles can contract and what, what it does is it, it results in something called accommodation, uh, which allows the lens, if, if these muscles are relaxed, ciliary muscles, then the lens is rather thin and that will affect focus. Or if you can contract them, it thickens the lens and that will also affect the focus. Whether or not it's thick or thin depends on the situation at hand. And so Finally, the inner tunic is uh, really cool. So this is uh, a shot of, of the retina. So the light is coming to the back right in here. And so this is the first layer in the, of the back of the eye, the retina. And then be below that is the coracoid coat. And then below that is the sclera. And so light is traveling through. And what I find kind of fascinating is that it travels through some neurons that don't really pick up the light these ganglion cells and the, these bipolar neurons, but it's these cells in the back of the retina. This whole thing is retina. So that in the back are these specialized photoreceptors called cones and rods. Rods are these cells that are more elongated and cones are sort of like an ice cream cone, which are sort of large and then they narrow. And those are the photoreceptor cells. And so, as I was mentioning this before, the, the back, so you're looking at the retina. So if you're looking into an eye, and so uh, an eye doctor would, would have this ability to look in if they put some drops in your eye and dilate your pupils and then look into the back of the eye and take some pictures. Here's the optic nerve. This is a blind spot. And this macula lutea or circular yellow spot is where the fovea is. This is where um, the best possible focus can take place. And here's your blind spot. And so this is what we're going to be talking about is the retina back here. And so the retina is where the images of light are focused, and especially at the fovea centralis. That's where it's maximum absorption. And then this is a picture of the optic disc. Again, this is the blind spot. This is where all the nerves are coalescing and going up into the brain. And again, the whole eye is, is kept open by the vitreous humor. I find that this picture is kind of interesting. I found this searching around on the internet. This is stained glass uh, uh, retina. <laughs> so here's the fovea and here's the optic disc. Kind of funny. So what's happening is uh, light's being refracted. And so the lens, the cornea is refracting it. The, the, the humors are to an extent in the lens really. And so the light ne needs to be focused. You can have a problem. This is perfect up here. You can have a problem if the light is focused beyond the retina, and then it would be blurry vision right here, or it could be focused before the retina, and then you'd have blurry vision here as well. And so one way to correct that is by putting a corrective lens in front of the cornea or a contact lens, which will affect where the light is being focused. But ultimately you want it to be focused right on the retina. And then you can make some accommodations by uh, contracting your uh, ciliary body and, and squeezing your lens, but um, that's not going to help too much. So these rods and cones are the photoreceptors. They're specialized neurons that are p picking up light. And so this is the part I think I find most fascinating because this is where you're taking a wave, which is what light is. And the different wavelengths are the different colors of the vis visible spectrum. And so uh, these cells actually pick up light and, and then turn that into an action potential. 
So the light's coming in and it's striking the retina. How does it work? And so we have these two kinds of cells. We have these rod cells and these cone cells. And so the cones are best at color and they work really well in bright light, but they're not very good in the dark as it turns out. And the, the uh, rod cells are good in the work in the dark. And these rod ones are only good with sort of um, black and white. And the cones are better for gray. And so as it turns out, we can actually tell whether or not an animal is actually seeing uh, in color by a analyzing if they actually have cones on their retina. And that's so we know that dogs can't see color because they have no cone cells, that's kind of interesting. And so I would, all of this is, is describing how the fact that there's a lot of cone cells in the, in the fovea centralis. So here's a picture, uh, lights coming in from this direction right here, lights coming in, it's passing through the ganglia and the bipolar cells. And here's the rod, which picks up um, uh, black and white, and then cones are picking up color right there. And then here's an actual electron micrograph Notice how the cone cells are kind of elongated uh, and the rods are, are slender. Uh, here's a picture of, of uh, all of the, the, the outer layer tunic. So here's the sclera going from outside in. Here's the pigmented coracoid co coat. Um, and then here's your retina right in here, which has your rods and cones and then your uh, bipolar cells and your ganglia cells. So lights coming in. This is the inside of the eye here lights coming in and it's being picked up by these photoreceptor cells. And so I'll try to touch on this. This is rather a complicated concept, but I'll see if I can, I'll do my best to try to explain this. In the rods and cones, in the membrane of these cells, in the cell membrane of, of the rod cells in particular, okay, they have a pigment called rhodopsin. And this rhodopsin, when light strikes it, uh, breaks up into uh, a protein called uh, opsin and retinol. And so what's happening is this retinol, uh, when light strikes it, this is a double bond right here in the retinal structure, this, this pigment right here. And it actually switches it in terms of a geometric isomer from a cis orientation to a trans orientation. And what results from that is basically the change in the pigment shape affects the protein shape and therefore it allows for an influx of sodium ions into the cell, therefore initiating an action potential in the photoreceptor. That's going to uh, uh, cause a depolarization ultimately when the sodium gates, voltage gates open up and that's how you get a nerve impulse. So it's kind of cool. Light is being picked up by the pigment right over here. It's being picked up by the pigment, but ultimately it's changing the shape of the protein, which is facilitating an action potential. Okay. So the breakdown of that rhodopsin initiates a nerve impulse. And then once the nerve impulse is generated, then as you may know, action potentials just jump from neuron to neuron and neurotransmitter and ultimately through the optic nerve and then to the occipital lobe in the brain. Again, another fascinating uh, stained glass window of, uh, of the retina, kind of cool. And so the cones um, are fascinating because they can do color and, there's, and they have uh, the ability to perceive blue light, which is, which is a high frequency, and red light, which is a long wave, and uh, low frequency. And then, the, so there's blue, green, and red. These are the primary uh, uh, colors that they're picking up. And so what happens is um, they can perceive, you can perceive different colors based on uh, what kind of light is coming in uh, to these cone cells. And so if you're, if you're seeing, uh, if all of them are stimulated, you'll, you'll be seeing white. If none of them are being stimulated, then it's gonna be dark in coloration. This is looking at the uh, frequencies of light here. These are the longer waves to the right and shorter waves to the left. Anything shorter than 30, 380 nanometers, we, we don't see. Anything longer than 760 nanometers, we cannot even see. And so again, it all ends up back here in the, in the back of the brain called the occipital lobe. And that's where we're able to see. That's where you're able to perceive what you're, what you're seeing. So hopefully that was clear. 
and that you're um, you're able to see the greatness that is the sense of sight. <laughs> Thanks for watching.